Have you ever had a restless night of sleep and wonder why you can't get back to sleep or why you even wake up to begin with? What if I told you that inflammation and neuroinflammation, a natural response or reaction to things like stress, infection, injury, or illness could be the culprit behind your restless nights? But how exactly does inflammation fuel poor sleep? And how would you know if this is driving your sleep issues? My name is Dr. Taranella, and this channel is dedicated to helping you improve and optimize your health. And in this video, we're diving into the science behind the vicious cycle of inflammation and disturbed sleep. And we'll explore some of the research and mechanisms connecting chronic inflammation to chronic sleep disturbance. And most importantly, we'll discuss strategies to understand if this might be driving your sleep issues and also how to potentially break this cycle of sleep disturbance. So if you're getting a lot out of these videos, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe to continue getting videos like this. All right, well, let's get started in the connection between inflammation and sleep. So the first thing to recognize about the connection between inflammation and sleep is that inflammation isn't always visible, meaning that we can't always see it in your blood tests or recognize it when we're looking at your lab values. And we've discussed inflammation in the past, and remember it occurs when the immune system activity is increasing relative to what it is most of the time. And your immune system does this to protect your body, and it's a good thing that we have this response. It's a necessary response to keep your organs, keep your tissues healthy. And that immune activity is promoted and can be measured through chemical messages that the immune system produces and their way of communicating between one another. And those chemical messengers are called cytokines. And the key within the immune response is balance, meaning that we want a response when you have an infection or problem, but we want that response to kind of calm down when necessary. And that's called negative feedback loops. And when those negative feedback loops are disturbed or broken, it leads to, instead of negative feedback, a feed forward process so that those signals that are supposed to help fight infections and help remove problems turn into more damage, more tissue destruction, and more problems versus leading to resolution and downregulation of that inflammatory process. And there's several reasons why that might happen, and we're not going to go into that right now. But as it ties in with sleep, one of the things that promotes resolution or downregulation of that inflammatory immune response is good sleep meaning that you're getting restful sleep, you're getting into the deeper stages of sleep, and that's going to generally calm down the whole body, the nervous system, but including the immune system. So back to how this relates to you is how are we going to actually measure this immune activity? And as I said, sometimes it can be actually measured and sometimes it can't. So we can measure the immune system response by looking at some of these immune chemicals. But in practice, like when you go see your actual doctor, we're kind of limited in the tools that we can use, limited in what is available to us in a clinical setting. So we rely on things like C-reactive protein, sedimentation rate, white blood cell counts, platelet counts, hemoglobin A1C, fibrinogen, reverse T3, cortisol, and other similar proxies for inflammation. And some of these tests are going to have more fidelity in giving you information about your immune system activity than others. It's important to look for these clues when they are there and, and understand how this might be tied in with your sleep. And so we do have some measurement tools, some tools that we can use, but we definitely don't have a 360 degree view of your immune system. And so in research settings, they may talk about uh, measuring interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha and things like that. We don't necessarily have the ability to check for those. And this is important to note as we look at the research and try and translate that into what is going to be presented to you in your blood work when you actually look at things. The fact is we have limited ways to probe into this question, but it doesn't mean there's no answers at all. So chronic sleep disorders like insomnia or other things related to lack of sleep is going to activate your body's immune response. And sleep patterns can be influenced by a lot of different things, including your environment, like if you're having lots of stress at your job or maybe working shift work where you're up all night and sleeping during the day that's going to impact how deep your sleep is and how restful your sleep is. Of course, social adversities and stress can also play a major role in how well you're sleeping as well. And these things, independent of what's going on with your sleep, can create inflammation in your body. So even if it's not affecting your sleep, you can have some level of impact on inflammation. 
But when poor sleep occurs, there's bound to be higher inflammation in the body as a result of that poor sleep. And so this process can be a vicious cycle where the inflammation can lead to disturbed sleep and poor sleep can also lead to more inflammation, more immune activity. And there are many, many studies showing this relationship. And I won't list those in the description, but there will be other studies that we're referencing here that will be in the description. And so the question that I had and was curious to know is, does inflammation lead to sleep issues independent of pain causing sleep disturbance? We all know that when we're not comfortable, we're not going to sleep as well because of the pain. So let's look at some of these research papers that I found when looking into this question. So there's a nice study that discussed how interleukin-1, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine, meaning it's going to enhance the amount of immune activity in the body, directly influences sleep. And specifically, this study demonstrated that interleukin-1 enhances non-REM sleep and reduces REM sleep in humans and animals. And these effects were independent in any measurable physical pain or discomfort pointing to the direct role of these cytokines, which are the immune cell communication devices in regulating sleep architecture. And just as an aside, many people think about REM sleep as the most important or restorative form of sleep. And it is very important, but it's really what we're pointing out here is the fact that the immune chemicals can disturb the, the normal architecture of sleep. And stage four sleep is the deepest stages of sleep. And the enhancement in the non-REM sleep here is not referring to enhancement in stage four sleep. Another research paper highlighted how TNF-alpha, which is another pro-inflammatory cytokine, can induce sleep disturbances by increasing this non-REM sleep. And in this case, also disturbed the REM sleep. And that occurred without any associated pain or discomfort. Another study in 2016 discussed how neuroinflammation, often triggered by systemic inflammation and marked by elevations in interleukin-6, which is directly related to CRP. When you have high interleukin-6, you're typically going to have higher CRP, and that can lead also to sleep disturbances by affecting the central nervous system in a negative way. Other studies have also emphasized how these cytokines like TNF-alpha and interleukin-6 can cause this cytokine-induced neuroinflammation, which then goes on to affect the hypothalamus. And this is the brain region critical for sleep and also hormone regulation. And again, it occurs without necessarily causing any noticeable pain. And you may know the hypothalamus as part of the HPA axis, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And it's a site of common concern with sleep and chronic stress issues. The classic example is that higher stress and higher cortisol can damage or disrupt the normal feedback mechanisms in the brain, in the hypothalamus, in the pituitary, leading to changes in circadian rhythms and sleep-wake cycles. And here we're seeing that the same type of internal physical stress and the way of inflammation can also drive a similar response on that hypothalamic pituitary axis. And the immune chemicals are causing this fight or flight kind of response, even if your cortisol is not necessarily high. The impact here is still on the brain. So if you find yourself in this situation or you think you might be in this situation, what can we do? Well, if you're someone that struggles with chronic sleep issues or maybe you're new to sleep issues and you haven't really explored this aspect of your health like the immune system and inflammation, the best place to start is with blood work. And not just any blood work though, you need to look at your blood work with a careful and skillful eye. So for example, a lot of times people get their C-reactive protein test done, and depending on which one you use, it'll say less than three is normal. Well, less than three isn't necessarily normal. You want it to be less than one and maybe even less than 0.5. Things like white blood cells as well, all these things have normal reference ranges, but if you're on the upper end for some of these inflammatory markers, you want to think carefully about how that might be affecting your body. Sed rate as well, A1C, serial cortisol testing, you might be getting cortisol being elevated because of the inflammation. You can also look at low pituitary hormones like luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, and thyroid stimulating hormone in the presence of low or lo low normal levels of testosterone, estrogen for females, thyroid hormones. You may be having problems at the pituitary output side of things, meaning that the low levels of hormones are not feeding back to the brain and causing an increased stimulus to those end tissues. So for example, with thyroid stimulating hormone, pituitary gland is supposed to stimulate the thyroid by producing that TSH. 
And then the thyroid hormone feeds back to the brain and tells the pituitary that it has enough. And same way with the hypothalamus, there's a three-way connection system here. And so we're saying here that if there's inflammation, you can some, sometimes disturb the feedback mechanisms. And that may be one clue that you might have this problem going on. But none of these tests alone is going to give you the answer, but they can only give you clues about the overall picture here. And changes in sleep, like disturbed sleep, waking up in the middle of the night, or just problems falling asleep can be challenging to find the source. And this is likely amplified by the epigenetic changes that occur when sleep problems are chronic. And that kind of keeps you siloed in that pattern of chronic sleep disturbance. And so when we're looking at solutions, what, you know, what can you do to help your body get out of this pattern? We want to do everything we can to change this pattern. So behavioral interventions like cognitive behavioral therapy for sleep have been shown to improve sleep quality. And these interventions work by helping you develop healthier sleep habits and manage your overall sleep hygiene. And many people are familiar with these, but it's a good place to start. And of course, a lot of us have probably heard this before, so that's not going to be the only recommendation, but I would just emphasize that you don't overlook this if you haven't given it a thorough look yet. So what about anti-inflammatories for inflammation? If inflammation disturbs your sleep or causes these problems with the mechanisms in the brain that help us sleep and have normal sleep architecture, can we just take anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen? Well, there is some evidence that anti-inflammatories can help improve sleep. But most of these studies are done in people that are having chronic pain or some kind of pain-related issue. And so I think the evidence for using something like that is limited and giving the potential side effects or downsides to using chronic anti-inflammatory medicines. I don't recommend that kind of thing unless you are in actual pain. And even if you are in pain, that could possibly lead to some other long-term problems. Remember, anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen and, and similar things, they don't resolve the inflammation. They just block certain aspects of it, leaving the other immune activity still going on in the background. So you don't necessarily know that it's there, but it's still happening behind the scene. And so with that in mind, I wouldn't recommend just taking anti-inflammatories. And we'll come back to some other possible ways of intervening there. But also wanted to mention some pharmacological things that may be useful here in terms of sleep and, and useful to kind of reset your body's sleep inflammatory profile, if you will. We talk about that vicious cycle of problems with sleep leading to lack of resolution. And we need to be careful with the medicines that we choose in this case, but they can be helpful. So one of the meds that I think is very helpful this way, if it works for you, if it helps you get better sleep, not everyone gets benefit from it. But I like trazodone, which is a atypical antidepressant. It's a much older medication and sometimes can be really helpful just to get people to fall asleep and stay asleep much easier. And it does, tends to not disturb the normal sleep architecture like some other meds that are in the benzodiazepine class, things like Ambien. They're not good for keeping you in the deeper stages of sleep, whereas trazodone is. Things like reishi mushrooms and curcumin can help by working as anti-inflammatories, but also improve the overall immune function. These are not just like cutting off one aspect of the inflammatory cascade, but they're getting more at the root problem and can be really helpful in certain situations. Not all people can benefit from these. And so you have to look at what your specific immune situation is. But I think broadly speaking, they're pretty safe and effective at helping downregulate the over activity of the immune system. And I explored this topic about sleep as well as treatments and options in detail in another video called How to Resolve Sleep Problems and also a follow-up video on what really causes trouble staying asleep. So you can check those out. Just search for those videos on the channel. So hopefully this video sheds light on how inflammation fuels poor sleep and the importance of breaking that sleep cycle for your overall health and downregulation of the immune activity. If you have any questions, feel free to drop those in the comment section. Happy to answer your question. If you want a more detailed, personalized guidance on this type of thing, consider joining the membership program. We'll have much more time and attention to dedicate to the questions that you have. Now, one question that you might have after watching this video is, what is the relationship between sleep and blood sugar? And you can find more on that video right here. Thank you again for watching. We'll see you next time.